Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures. I know we're a very friendly church. Maybe overtly, overtly friendly. No shame here. We're family. But maybe you haven't connected to your neighbor like you should. So I want you to connect to your neighbor and I want you to say, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. And then your other neighbor say, For he is good. And his mercy and love endure forever. Yeah. It is always an amazing treat. A great privilege and honor to gather together in God's house under the canopy of the shadow of Shaddai in the presence of the Lord together. We have a lot of things in common. You know what that is? We need them. You know what that is? It's quite miraculous that we've all made it this far. You know what else we have in common? He has great plans for us. Praise the Lord. We're always blessed with some of the most amazing people on the planet who serve and make this possible. Can you just tell those who serve, seen and unseen, thank you so much. We love and appreciate you. I, I love it. Like, like today was so full, not just in numbers, but in the presence of God. And I love you guys. You're awesome. Thanks for setting a table before us all the time in his presence. We love you guys. You can grab a seat. Well, I'm very eager and uh, excited to share the word with you today. I've had this tucked in the cavern of my heart for a couple weeks. And I feel like today's the day to to share it. Um, It's going to be hardy. Not not, not, not as much mechanical, but but hardy. And uh, last week, we taught on the parable of two sons or two daughters, whatever you're comfortable with, and talked about how to shift from intention to action. Today I want to speak and I want to share on um, a glorious Mount Rushmore classic parable, the parable of the great wedding or the parable of the great feast located in Matthew 22. But not get very mechanical on this because we could sit on this theologically and dissect this thing for all of eternity. I just want to point out something, a verse that has just really gripped my heart, and I hope it grips yours. My prayer is that today's message and sermon would go way beyond today. It would become part of the internal fabric of your being. Amen? Are you ready for the Word? You hungry for the Word? Do you have your Bibles? It seems like you're eager and awake. Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 14, but we'll highlight verse number 5. Today's title is Don't Make Light of This. Don't Make Light of This. Um, I feel so strong about that title. I have it like written five times in my notes. Don't make light of this. Don't make light of this. Don't make light of this. Or pay attention. And Jesus answered and he spoke to them again by parable. This is the third parable he's speaking after he cleansed the temple. The first one being the parable of the two sons. The next one being the parable of the wicked vineyard gardener. The third one being the parable of the marriage feast. Just before his crucifixion, he is literally in the temple. Jesus is in the temple teaching three parables. At this time, the chief priests and Pharisees want to arrest him, lay hands on them. And he speaks this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. So much of the scripture refers to Jesus as the bridegroom. And marriage tapestry is from beginning to end. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, 
I've prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatted cat are all killed. All things are ready. Please just come to the wedding. And then verse 5 is where I want to hang today and dissect today. It's what's gripped my heart, our focus and attention. And I just want to say this possibly the pandemic of our nation and the pandemic of the people right here in verse 5 that's creating so many other symptoms. But they made light of it. And they went their own way to his own farm, another to his own business. Kind of gutting, huh? Kind of takes your breath away, doesn't it? That's where I want to park today. That's why the message is titled, Don't Make Light of This. Don't, don't make light of this. And the rest seized his servants, and they treated them spitefully, and they killed them. But when the king heard it, the father, he was furious. He's talking about his son, Jesus. He was furious. And he sent out armies and he destroyed those murderers and he burned their city. He said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways and as many as you can find, invite to the wedding so that those servants went out into the highways and they gathered together all whom they found, both, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he saw that there was a man there who didn't have on the wedding garment so he said to him, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the very famous line of Jesus, many are called, few are chosen. We could get very technical with this today, but I don't want to get too technical. I just want to stay hardy with it. Don't make light of this. Don't make light of this. Father, we honor your word today. Your presence and your anointing and your spirit and your word is... We're so honored to be exposed to your word. We love you. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. There are some quite powerful and practical lessons to be learned from these parables. It was often the favorite communication style of Jesus, which scripture referenced nearly 40 varying parables throughout Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I would like to explore today, discuss, and consider what I would propose to you as two very crucial and vital aspects to one's life. Now, I am privileged to be a pastor and hopefully your pastor. Therefore, I'm coming at it from a spiritual angle and to bring you closer to Jesus and to inspire you spiritually speaking especially in connection to your relationship with the Lord and the conjunction of what he's given you to steward, to guard, and to protect. The, these crucial, vital aspects today, you've got to get this, is our attention, our one's attention. The value of your attention is extremely costly. Not only our attention, but our attitude. Attention and attitude towards the Lord and the proximity of our life is very, very crucial. Attention. A attention is what someone values and what you give your life to. You are investing your life into what you have given your attention to. A attention deals with one's awareness. You have to be aware to give the proper attention to. A attention is notice taken of something or someone 
regarding of someone or something that is of interest and of importance. The only reason you're giving your attention to it is because it's caught your interest. You're interested, you're intrigued by that, therefore you're giving your precious attention to that someone or something. Attention is the behavior a person uses to focus their senses and their energy towards something. Attitude defines the way you live your life. It's your culture. Everyone has an attitude that defines how they live. Attitude uh, is, is the settled way of thinking feeling about someone or something, and typically it's referred to or reflected in your behavior. Attention and attitude determine so much in our lives, especially towards the Lord. The way you do anything is the way you do everything. Our attention and our attitude need to be brought to awareness, just like in 2 John 2, 8, it's become one of my favorite verses as of late. It says, look to yourself or discern your attention, watch yourself, so that we don't lose the things we've worked for and miss out on the reward. If we lose our attention and the attitude shifts, we will lose out on what we worked for and won't finish well and miss out on the full reward. It's so important that you discern your attention and the attitude by which you're operating in. Here in Matthew 22, Jesus, you gotta get the context, church. Jesus himself just cleansed the temple. He's moments and hours away from the crucifixion, and where is he at? He is in the temple teaching God's word. Don't miss that. In this antichrist culture, Jesus, the last moments of his life, was in God's house teaching God's word to God's people. And he's teaching the third parable that has caught the attention of the Pharisees and the religious leaders, and they're so after him, asking, who gave you authority to talk this way? And they want to lay hands on him to shut him up. And then he goes into this profound parable of the wedding feast. Jesus leads with these parables. Remember that, that parables are, are, are strategic because parables provide us invaluable perspective on life. They bring us to a place of attention, hoping to shift our attitude towards God in a right, proper manner. They're invaluable spiritual insights or understanding. They give us access and entrance. Parables are invitations from God to us to partner in his life, they're the will of God, the plan of God. It gives us these, these profound truths, it's desiring to grab our attention. You know what Jesus was fighting most then and we're fighting now? Getting the attention of the people. Do you know the biggest fight right now? Getting the attention of the people because the enemy has paid for your attention. The hardest thing right now is to get your full attention to what you have to give it to. Because everything is after your attention. To get you disinterested and to pull you away. So Jesus had the challenge we have. A distracted, distorted people pulled away in their attention, now with the wrong attitude toward God. How do I fix humanity? I have to capture their attention to shift and change their attitude culture to get them back to where God wants them. That's the work we have in this hour, to captivate your attention beyond a Sunday morning, get you to a place of transformation, to shift your whole attitude so you can function as God wants you to function. And and it's a strong, strong battle. Say it with me. I want my attention back. 
I want clarity back. I want to be in charge of my attention. I don't know about you, but, but reading the text, reading the verse, reading that, I, I'm sure like you, I would assume you're totally shocked and extremely puzzled at verse 5. No? I am, like to my core. That is a shocking, puzzling reality here. The greatest to invitation to receive is to someone's wedding. You and I know that at this level, this is a type and shadow of the Father giving his Son to humanity and inviting a people to the highest privilege of all, a wedding. Now, in that culture, it must be said, you'd always give two invitations, one to start the attention, the other one to follow through on the attention. So he's given the second invitation, and all of a sudden, he explains everything is ready, everything is prepared. All you have to do is give your attention and follow through. That's all you got to do. And there's nothing in more important on that day in Jerusalem, or th- there's nothing that can even come close to the honor of this invitation. Yet, the Bible points out a pandemic with deep, crippling symptoms that we face and they face, and it says that they made light of it, paid no attention to it, and went their own way. I'm stuck there. I want to assess things there. What is God saying to us? What's the warning? What's the caution of the hour? If it was prevalent then, it's got to be prevalent now. Or maybe even a more extreme way. Because they didn't have all the devices we have. Now, Now, it's not just enough for me to be shocked and you to be shocked, but it actually points out that let's say the king is the father. We can totally say that. It says that but when the king heard about it, he was furious. So it really, it really matters to God. What I'm sharing with you, what I'm giving to you, if you try, this really matters to the father. It says that he was furious because the people didn't pay attention to the invitation or to what he was doing. And then he concludes, many are called. Everyone loves the invitation. Oh my gosh, how flattering we were invited. People love the flatterer. He says it, many are called. Everyone receives an invitation, but few pay attention to the invitation. Few respond. They're called by God, chosen by God, but few pay attention to the invitation and are called. You know what that's saying to me? In the Father, he desires none to perish. His love is for everyone, for God so loved the whole world. That's not in question. It's showing us that everyone receives the invitation of the Father, but few truly pay proper attention and don't make light of it. We gotta move, like I said last week, from intention to action. What, what, what this parable is painting too is in our not too distant near future. Do you know what's ahead of us who call on Jesus and fall him fully? Do you know what we're heading toward? A marriage feast. Yeah. It's a seven year. Do you know what's in our future? We are heading directly. This is not just a parable. This is a literal typology that they're ahead of us, ahead of the church is a marriage feast feast of the land that for seven years we will celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ and have a party of self. That's in our future. Hallelujah. For the Lord God reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. We're the bride and he's the bridegroom and it's time that we as the bride are ready and prepared for his return. Many are called, but few are preparing themselves to be chosen. And I'm just a little concerned that some people are taking this a little too lightly. 
Just a little concerned we've had enough church and enough sermons and enough moves of God, but maybe we're taking the Lord a little too casually. And we've become careless in our attention and our attitudes need major adjustments toward the Lord. He said it. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. He sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. They were not willing to come. He didn't stop there again. He sent out other servants saying, to tell them. Tell them they're invited and tell them that like everything's prepared. It's going to be the best of the best of the best. All things are ready. Just come. Just say yes over and over. Just respond. Just, just, just come. But, but, but it says that they, it's male and female, it's young and old, it's, it's religious leaders in that room. These guys, they were so offended at Jesus because you had to go to them to get the answers from God. They were so offended. But they, now we can be in context, let's say the Jews first. This was to the Jews. But if the Jews respond, this is, a, this is a reference to humanity, to the state of humanity. Could it be America? Of course it could be the American church. Of course. Of course it could. In our comfort seating and beautiful, we can just carelessly lose our attention. Of course it is. It's, it's humanity. It's the struggle in your marriage, in your home with what God's given you. And if we're not careful and have hearty preaching like this, then what they did, we'll do. And they just made light of it and went their own way. They put their business, their game, in front of that wedding feast. And it should grip our heart. It should bring a holy caution and a holy awe. Both the tree of life and ESV said, but they just paid no attention. Their attention was gone. It was elsewhere. Let me tell you something. Look at me. Where's the camera? <laughs> Your attention, hear me, is somewhere. The enemy just wants it elsewhere. Your attention is somewhere. The enemy just wants it elsewhere. Your attention is somewhere. The enemy just wants it elsewhere. Hey, church, we're living in a crucial hour. I thought humility was a virtue, not pride. We now have pride. How backward? We're now thinking pride. No, pride is the word. We want humility. I'm, I could go on a rant. But I, we're living in a crucial, critical hour in all humanity, and I'm here by the Spirit of God trying to warn you, be careful of your attention. And be mindful of your attitude. It's a crucial, crucial hour, like then, like now. And the enemy is doing everything he can to pay for your attention. Pay for it. You'll pay for your attention. Don't make light of this. Don't make light of this message. Don't make light of this sermon. Don't, don't make light of this. Don't, don't make light of what he's, don't make light of this. Don't make light of this great, 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 awesome salvation. Hebrews 2, 1 says, therefore, if we don't give our uh, attention, we will drift. If we don't give more earnest attention to it, we will drift away. Your humanity will drift. If you don't give your attention to it, it'll take you away. We must give more earnest attention to the things we've heard, at least we drift away. For if the word was spoken through angels, proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience, how shall we escape if we neglect? Don't pay attention to this great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those. How shall we escape if we neglect? Don't pay attention to this great, 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 great salvation. Jesus taught, instructed, corrected his disciples, and he's like, you guys, don't rejoice. You're rejoicing in the wrong things. You're rejoicing in the wrong things. 
your paycheck, your relationships. Or your, no, you're, you really got your attention in the wrong place. Don't rejoice in that, but rejoice that your name is written in God's book. Church, the greatest of all is the great salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we aren't aware of that and seizing that, we will neglect that and drift away from that. And that is tragic. It's tragic. We can't just throw it all on the Jews because we've got to throw it on the Gentiles too. We can't just throw it all on the women because the women need a man. And we can't just put it all on the man because the man need a woman. So we've got to be honest. Were they just too busy? I mean, did some, what was, I mean, let's just, let's just practically watch this out. Was the weather nice? No, on, did they get a new car? Was somebody in town? Was there a greater invitation, Tommy? Was their, was their calendar too busy? Were they lazy? Were they... Let's just practically walk this out. Oh, they were preoccupied. Or, or maybe they just were disinterested. Was there a better invitation somewhere else in Jerusalem that day? What paid? The costly price for their attention. And it doesn't take much of us today. Just do one survey at the mall or any driving, and you'll realize the people driving don't even aren't even paying the right attention because their attention is everywhere. Kids need to talk. God wants to pray, but their attention is Why do you miss most sermons that are said? Because your attention is. But you have the right intent. Why don't you follow through on obedience? Because your attention is. Therefore, our attitude toward God is probably not in an honoring right place. The attitude of this nation toward God to me is repulsive. It's disregarding. It's no respect. No more. The attitude, why? Because our attention has lost its value. I mean, was it the Super Bowl? Was it NASCAR? Was it, what what, what was it? What is it today that interrupts your prayer, that doesn't let you spend time in his word, that pulls you away every which way from having that conversation, from telling someone you love them, from being honest, from walking it through, from showing your kids it? What is it? that's pulling your tension away. They fail to understand its significance, its value, its importance, and the God-sized opportunity before them. Do you realize what God's put before you? Uh, um, to, to be biblically correct, we, we can't fully compare the, the parable in Luke 14, the great feast with this one, because they're a little bit different timing, but they have the same conjunctions. It's the same truth. Th- this is a little different. But let me just par- parallel Luke 14's uh, same context, same idea, a little bit different. They're not the same. I don't think we can put them as the same. But, but they're uh, a wedding feast and then a great supper. Just hear this. Then he said a certain man gave a great supper and he invited many. And he said to his servants, supper time. Say to those who are invited, come, all things are ready. But, but now this gives us a little different insight in verse 18. But they all with one accord just made excuses. Ah, what hinders your attention is the ability to excuse the responsibility. So it's so easy to excuse responsibility, not on me. No, it's, it's, on, it's, it's on you, parents. It's on you. It's, it's on It's on how I was raised, it's on what I don't have, it's on, it's on, I'm in a fire, I'm in a challenge. Welcome to life. Everybody in this room have a laundry list of excuses, but the blood of Jesus and the name of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit can eradicate every excuse and bring you to a place of triumphant victory in Jesus. What's your excuse? What's my excuse? We all have excuses. I don't want to get too literal. You know what we could say at this moment. They're like tongues. Everyone has them. 
or whatever you feel comfortable with. If you all have a thumb, some not everyone has all five fingers. Denny's losing a thumb, but excuses are everywhere, especially in this hour. Excuse to leave your marriage, excuse not to be faithful. You've been hurt, and so now we're victimized and we're vindicated to the victimization because we become so self-induced as lovers of self and not lovers of God that our attention is on self and not on the Lord, so we are excusing ourselves from the Lord because we love ourselves more than we love the Lord. And I don't even know what to do. It's hard in this hour. What do you do every week trying to grab your attention beyond the service and beyond the Sunday to a real heart transformation for Jesus? How many people have made lie to their marriages? Lie to the season they're in because you don't like it. Lie to what God's given you to be faithful with to light with what God's called you to partner with. Light of what you're supposed to pray for. Light of what you're supposed to give to. Light of what you're supposed to be a part of. We just make light of it. I told you it was hearty today. And I haven't got hearty. I just want to shout from the rooftops to pastors or to doctors or to teachers or to moms or to teenagers and just say by the Spirit of God, what have you made light of? What have you been careless with? What have you put on the shelf? Here's what I really want to say. Where have you misplaced God? Where have you replaced God with? Preachers and doctors and all of us. Have we made light of it? I'm supposed to study to show myself approved. It's an honor to fight and labor for this word. And if you knew the struggle, it's an honor to prepare the word of the Lord. It's an honor. I'm supposed to rightly divide the word. That I'd be ready in season, out of season to preach a word in season. Isn't that right? What has God given you? Steward. So they made excuses in the first one. I mean, I don't know, should we read it? It's, it's almost embarrassing, you know? It's like, should we waste our time? Yeah. One goes, I bought, a, I bought a piece of ground and I gotta go see it. Now, can I just stop for a moment? Hey, Scott, have you ever bought something you never saw before? Never. You're wise. Do you buy something, Tommy, you don't see? No, you see it first. I don't even know if that's valid. I think he's lying, lying, pants on fire. <laughs> Liar! <laughs> Right, I mean, do you buy? You know, you see it first. So I just think, like, this is, he's just a compulsive liar. Like, ha, ha, ha. But look what he said. I got land, I got to go see it. No, no, there's a, a feast with your name on the table. And if you miss it, you miss it. Oh, I got to go. And then the other one is like, um, can I be excused? I bought five yoke of oxen, and I got to go test them. The only maybe valid one that I would give for one week in the year is they're married, so I would give a honeymoon, right, maybe, but because I'm married. So they came and reported to the master, and the the master of that house, he became angry. Do you hear? I want you to hear God. I know we, God's loving, but you got to hear from God. He, this stuff matters to him. It matters to him. It does. And God, God is full of love, but, but there is a side to God that does value what he's done, and he does care about the destruction of your life, and he does want to stand for truth and righteousness because the foundation of his throne is justice and righteousness are the foundations of his throne, and the fire goes before him. There is a justification to God, and what's right is worth the fight, and it does grieve his heart. When we make light and let the enemy rob our attention elsewhere. If I could sing, I would sing right now and hold a hymnal song or something. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. 
Oh, go quickly, go, 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 go to the city, go to the poor, go to the lame, go to the blind, I don't care. Just just let everybody know there's room. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, tell your neighbor, come on, tell the world, come on, tell them all. I don't care where they are, get them to me, get them to my house, get them to my presence. The only thing that can help this generation is the presence of God, is the move. Get them to Jesus, get them to Jesus, get them to the Lord, get them, come, 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 to the Spirit of God, come, come. We can have seminars and success, but get into the presence of God. Yes. And the master said, go, that my house may be filled and full. What, what have you made light of, spiritually speaking, pertaining to your relationship with the Lord? What vows have you said? What have you put in the place of him? What have we misprioritized? Made light of, diminished, excused, 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 excused. Made excuses for. Well, God knows. He knows my heart. We dealt with that last week. He knows my heart. What a, what a, what a maybe, hold on, maybe is that devil talk? In some ways? He sees your heart, but it doesn't mean he wants you to stay there. He wants you to get to a place of action. Come on. You know know what I'm saying? He does know your heart, but he wants your heart to go from intention to action that I have given you my attention and now my attitude towards you. I'm not making light of it. I'm reprioritizing. I'm leading my, I'm aligning my life in this way. Don't, don't throw stones at me. Throw them at him because they wanted to arrest him too. And I kind of feel some of your, 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 (laughs) I don't know what I feel. What have you put on the shelf? Eternal things. These are eternal things. These are God things. Paul says it to Galatians 5, 7. You're running so well. You're running so well. I haven't ran all week. So just for an example, you, you, were, you, you were running so well. Man, you were strong. You had right stride. Gary's a world-class uh, trainer. And Sandra, he's world-class right here. We had good form, and we were liquid up, and we were hydrated, and we were, we were running so well, but, but what hindered you from obeying? What, what came in? What took your attention away? How do you divert? Because your attention, well, in your marriage, it well, with the Lord, it went. You were running well. You were focused. You were in. You were serving, but the enemy came to get your attention. You were running so well, church, pastor. You were doing so good. But who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion, this persuasion doesn't come from God. God's not the God of confusion. He's not shoulder tapping you all the time with confusion. No, 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 that's not God. Should you go? Should you? That's the enemy. No. Should you go? Should you pray? Should do you belong? That's not, the, that's not God's persuasion. It's settled. It is sealed. It is the will of God. Stay strong. Stand. It's not, God's not creating confusion. Do you belong at the feet? No, you've been invited. Stay fortified. Stay anchored. Be immovable. Be strong in this hour. Stay. That persuasion is, is the enemy. And it comes to all of us. A little leaven... Just a little bit. Levens. This is a little heavy. So thankful the Holy Spirit led me to this late Friday night. Making light of Jesus Christ and of the great salvation provided through him is the damning sin of the world. What took place in this parable is they were careless. Multitudes perish through mere carelessness. I have it written in my Bible. It's a proverb I live by. If you treat it casually, you'll become a casualty. It's in my Bible. Come on, camera. Really, 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 really close. What you take carelessly, you'll become a casualty. 
Beware, the enemy is lurking like a lion seeking whom he may devour. Stand fast. Be alert. Sober. Attention. Attention. What you take casually, you'll become a casualty. They were careless. You get careless in that relationship and you slip up on some things. You, you were dating and you had some non-negotiables and then you got careless with it in the wrong places and then you, the enemy just gets you careless. It just becomes common. It becomes familiar. It's just Pastor Matt. It's just the church. It's just, but when you walked in, you knew when you, that marriage was once so sacred, but now it's become common and you become cat. You once loved that job. You got there early. You got there late. You didn't, but now it's just this job. And now you're more focused on the thorn than the rose. The enemy wants your attention to distort your attitude. Multitudes perish through carelessness who show no direct care or concern for the things of God, but are careless as with their souls. There are also the busyness and profit of worldly employments hinder many in choosing the Savior. It would appear today that the greatest challenge that we're facing is everything is after our attention. To negatively diminish our attitudes toward God and hope to divert and usher my direction away. Attitude, attention will determine the direction I live and lead. What's fascinating to me here is that in that small verse of verse 5, when they made light of it, it says, and they went there, I'll insert it, amplified own ways, one to his own farm and family. L- listen. What they made light of, they now went and lived their own life, their own way. So when we diminish the voice of God, the presence of God, the leadership of God, we're actually diverting to a life of our own. You know that God has a clear perspective on this, a clear way we should live? In Romans 14, verse 6 and 9, it compares all humanity. It says, one person esteems our values one day above another. So, so within a row like this, like, like some people esteem the day different than the other. Just the day. Another esteems every day alike. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. Esteem is, 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 att- is speaking to what? Your attention and your attitude. It says, he who observes the day should observe it to the Lord. But he who does not observe the day to the Lord does not observe it at all. Do you know that from God's perspective, you should observe every single day as holy, sacred, and special? Some people treat the day just normal. Not in God. You should observe the day as unto the Lord. That changes your attention and your Oh, I'm on assignment today. I woke up today. Today carries destiny. How do you esteem? It means regard. It's your attention and attitude toward it. So within a row like this, someone esteems the day like it's just no big deal. But some people have seen the day and go, oh my gosh, I'm going to pray. I may hear from God. My steps are ordered by, this is the day the Lord's made. Oh, wow, this is incredible. Well, today... I get to drive my car and sit in traffic. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. I get to eat food. I get to talk. Whoa, this day. But others, I hate this day. It's the hump week. It's my. In God, every day should be holy, sacred. Don't you make light of Tuesday. And don't you make me get ter- 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 terrific Tuesday or winning Wednesday, whatever. I don't care what you want me to call it. But I'm here to tell you in God, everything matters. Everything carries value. Everything is significant. Everything should be held with honor. He who eats should eat to the Lord. He who gives should give thanks to the Lord. For none of us live to themselves. And no one dies to himself. If you live, we should live to the Lord. Get the point? Get the perspective? Who are you living to? Who are you living for? 
in your home, and your, don't you know you're the thermostat of your world? You set the temperature of your entire world. A little joy, a little strength. This day, this job, this people, we have it in our lobby. This day, this place, this people, and we added this year in God carry each. Don't make light of it, Matthew Pollock. Don't you make light of it. This day, this year, that's how God desires. How's your attitude for the day? You get to shop for your family. You get to do chores. I get to take out the trash. Under the Lord, I take out there. Under the Lord. Under the Lord. Under the Lord. You get to take a walk. You get to clean up your... Under the Lord. And this will change your attitude if you get the right attention focused. Because there's nothing worse than a bad attitude in the midst of what God said, this is the day I've made. Amen. In God, we should make light of nothing but esteem everything. How you eat. In God, we should make light of nothing but esteem. You don't know, but just last night in our facility, up in our little studio, at 1 a.m. for three hours, there was a national podcast recorded in our little church here that is part of the second largest podcast in the world. You just don't ever make light. You have no idea. Every day matters and carries significance. How you eat, how you dress, the people, your relationship. So much is attacking our attention. It's just like in Exodus 32. I mean, these people were like led by Moses, the greatest pastor. Fire by night, cloud by day. The children of Israel saw the miracle of Pharaoh and miracle day in and day out. And, miracle, and, and Moses is on the mountain with the Shekinah glory of God. And Moses takes a little longer coming down than is needed. Do you know why I think God puts delays in there? You know why God does? Because God uses time to see if you're called or chosen. Only time reveals if you're real. So God allows time to set in to get beyond the emotion. So God withheld Moses to see where the people were at. Why does it take longer? Because God wants to see, are you just called? Or are you willing to pay the attention to be chosen? Everyone loves the call. Everyone loves... I, I called a friend for his birthday, a young, young man, and I said, happy birthday to you. And Abby goes, oh, that's so sweet, babe. Everyone would love a phone call you know, from the pastor. I do too. Don't you love a birthday phone call? Don't you love the phone call? Yeah. Oh, we love that. But we don't love the work, the hardship. So God withholds Moses and, and delays him from coming down. And guess what the people do? Immediately they turn and they go, Aaron, come here. Can we like take the earrings and the gold of the people and can we build a calf and then can we start? No, 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 no. This is not even like possible. Yeah. These are the children of Israel. Miracle after miracle. Moses took a little bit longer, like a couple more days. And within a couple days, their attention, their attention was sabotaged. And they then turned from turning to God to, and Moses comes down with the Ten Commandments and loses his mind because the people have turned from God and they're singing to a golden calf. And you say, never. And I say, so can we. Time will tell from Sunday to Sunday, what do we turn to? Where do we end up? Has a nation changed their, of course we have. The whole nation's attention has turned. And it's trying to do the same to you. I, I mean, Moses is like, I'm so done with these people. And God's like, no, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> So we're both done. 
the, and, he, and God uses some superlative, the stiff neck. I mean, he's just like, could you imagine? But again, I want to just tell you that. Here's the wisdom of God. Why does it take longer? Because God's testing your heart to see your endurance and your true character. You know why if God gave it all to you overnight, he would never know if you have the ability to truly love him even without it. The real test is will you love him without it. So it takes time to see, are you just, you like the phone call or do you like to walk this out? Are you called or are you chosen? Are you just called? I think Sunday's the called people. But, but, but your private life is the chosen people. What you do when no one, that's the chosen people. Many are called, gifted, called and no, but who are chosen? This is the hour for the remnant who's chosen to stand up and to really live out this life. I got seven minutes, and I gotta finish this, this message. How, how does that happen? Well, Solomon, Solomon, who was David's son, and, and just inherited everything, and started off so right. In fact, when God presented to him and showed him himself at Gideon, Gibeon, he said, whatever you want, Solomon, I'll give it to you. And Solomon was so pure, he goes, I just want wisdom and understanding to judge right between evil, and I just want to stay faithful to you. Within the covenant of Solomon, God told him, Solomon, you can have whatever, but you just can't have foreign women. There's people outside the covenant that you can't have. Just stay within the covenant. God's good. Just stay within the home. Stay within the marriage. It's, God, he just stay within the confines. You're good, but just do it my way. 1 Kings 11 says Solomon loved foreign women, and those women are what turned his heart away, and Solomon turned from God to worshiping false idols. How does it happen? Because God got Solomon. Satan got his attention outside the covenant, and it lured Solomon. It happens real subtle. Little by little, the enemy pulls your attention away, and now you're outside the covenant, and you've compromised, and now your heart attitude is away from God. Solomon loved foreign women, and they turned his heart from God. Don't love things outside the covenant. Love your wife. Love your church. Love his word. Don't love things outside the confines. And it's a big confine. It is. It's a big umbrella. Don't get out of the confines. I, I got one more thing I got to say. Good timing, Alec. Uh, um, we okay? I'm just starting to enjoy myself, so I'm gonna go. This is this is like, so there's this guy called Aiken, and there's AI before AI. AI is coming, but there's AI in in Joshua, <laughs> and AI is a land. And God says, um, um, like like go to AI and take everything. Just don't touch the sacred things. That's all. That's all. The, the, just don't touch it. Like just don't touch the tithe. You have it all, but just don't. Well, there's this guy, Achan. And underneath, they hid some sacred things. And Achan, one person in Israel, just wanted to touch what's sacred to God. And the whole nation lost the fight. And Joshua goes, there's no way we lost this fight. How do we lose this fight? And then Joshua comes and he goes, the whole team stand up. Who? I mean, this is violent. This is in your Bible. Who? Who sinned? Who sinned? Who sinned? This is Joshua's. Who? 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 And they find out this man, Achan took some sacred things and touched it, touched it, and the whole team lost the battle because Satan took Achan's attention. They took him out and killed him. Hear me, I told you it's hardy. What is Satan trying to take your attention away that's causing you to lose the battle? That's why I wouldn't touch the tithe. That's not yours. You're touching what's holy. I wouldn't touch Sunday. Don't touch the, don't, don't touch the marriage. That's holy. Who, woe to them who try to come against. Don't you touch. Don't you look at it. Don't you get into that. That's holy stuff, guys. Don't you come against. That's holy stuff. Don't you start touching things you shouldn't be touching. No, no, no. That's the Lord. That's God's anointing. That's God's word. That's God's. Don't you start judging, getting critical. Don't you start, no, no, no. Don't you start gossiping. No, no, those are, be careful. Don't make light of this kind of stuff. 
So what's the idols of the world? What's turning our nation? What is it? What's out there? What are these foreign gods and entities working? I'll tell you what they are. Psalms 135, 15, 21, the idols of the nation are silver and gold, the works of man's hands. You know what wants your attention? Silver and gold, the work of your hands. Be careful. Be careful, mammon. Be careful you don't become a slave to what you're working for. Don't let your ministry become it. Be careful. Be careful. Don't replace his presence with something else. Don't, don't. Be careful. God says it. The idols of the nation are silver and gold, what you're working for, and you and I know it. That's probably pulling your attention away in worry and in fear and in time. Get back to the Lord God. Because he says this, they have mouths, they can't speak, they have ears, they don't see, they can do nothing for you. They have mouths, they don't speak, they have ears, they don't use, they have, they have, uh, they have mouths, but, uh, but bless the Lord, fear the Lord. First John 5, 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. As I end today, very, very strong, we must, I, I plead, I implore you, I implore you, we must take God at his word literally and seriously. I implore you, I implore you by the spirit of God, this is literal and this is serious. Heaven and hell is real. Your attitude toward God's matters, what you do now will carry eternity. We are heading to a marriage feast of the Lamb. We will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account. I'm telling you, you gotta take him literally and seriously. It is an hour to wake up church and get your attention. It's time we become very, 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 very intentional to leading our families and not compromising and not drifting and not wavering and not wandering and not allowing this culture Take our attention from the Lord Jesus Christ. And the whole nation of Israel had the wrong attitude toward God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Serve him with rejoicing and trembling. So I say it to you. I say it. I'm done. Don't make light of his presence. Don't make light of his person. Spend time with Jesus. Don't make light of his presence. Don't make light of the invitation he's given you. Galatians 6.10 says, God has presented to you a great big opportunity. Don't make light of what he's called you to do. Don't make light of it. Don't make light of today. In the New King James Version Bible, the word today is used 150 times. Today, if you'll hear, today. Don't make light of today, 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 today. This may be a little bit scary for my family, but I've purpose in my heart every time I get behind this pulpit, this may be the last message I ever preach. And I want to leave here, poured out like a drink offering and giving you every, because tomorrow's not promised, church. Today, live today. Let those who you love, love. Tell them you love them. Forgive, choose today. Don't neglect today. <laughs> Conserve for tomorrow, today. Don't make light of what he's given you to keep, to guard, to protect. A man has received nothing, at least it come from heaven. What you have is from heaven to keep. Oh, Timothy, guard what he's given. I'm fighting. I'm protecting what he's given. I don't have to compromise for what I have. I'm keeping what he's given me. The last thing I want to end with, and I'm going to say it, and I feel this so strong Jesus is in the temple teaching there is a New Testament end time commandment to the church and it's so important you know what it says whatever you do do not forsake or make light of my church look at me in the face I'm going directly at this and we listen to me do not allow the enemy 
to take away your attention from being in the house of God. You will never be at your full strength until you become vitally planted in a part of the local church. It's the Bible. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as is the manner of some, but how much more the need be as it gets closer to his return. And I'm calling you back to the house of God, to the place of God. Let's honor him on Sundays. Get the right attention, get the right attitude. Let's prioritize our lives. There's something about this place. We need his presence, we need the anointing. We need to be in church. Don't compromise his house. Don't compromise his house. And I believe in my heart, I believe in my heart, the way the enemy sabotaged this nation is he didn't start with the people, he started right here in the pulpit. And he started with the people. And when he attacked the pulpit to scatter the shepherd, he wanted to scatter the sheep. And the reason our nation's where it's at is because Sunday's no longer holy. It is holy. It's the Sabbath. It's holy unto the Lord. And I say, get back to the presence of God and the house of God. It's so important. It's so important. And I'm just telling you, as much as I love God and you love God, you and I know we would not be half of where we are without the corporate gathering of the saints, man. I need you. You need me. I need to touch you. Come on. I need to touch you. I need to pray for you. I need to lay hands on you. I need you to go. I need each other together. We need each other. I need to be carried. I need to be carried. And I need... I need, I need to, I need each other. Right. I need the preaching. I need the anointing. I need to get in the anointing of God. I need, I need the house of God. I need his presence. I need his house. And you know what the enemy's done? He's done to attack the church by telling Antichrist, you can't trust him, you don't need, and what he's done to get the people's attention away. I'm calling you back. Thank God for online. It's a supplement, but you need to be in the house of God. And if we gotta tear off the roof, we'll tear off the roof and let people in. Don't make light. I believe, it's my prayer, I don't know how God does it, but in all these years of preaching, he has never failed me with a word. I've never looked elsewhere, I've never, every single time the Spirit of God has given me a word for me, for you. If you miss that word, that may be the word you need for your week to get your attention. If you make light of that, if I make light of that, that may be the exact thing we needed. Now, if you're in this church and God doesn't speak to you here, I give you permission to take this invitation and go to a place where the Spirit of God, whether quiet or loud, whether sweating or not, you don't choose your preacher. You don't. God chooses. God chooses. And God first gives you what you need, and then you find out that's what I want. If God's not speaking to you here, go to a place where God's speaking to you. But if God's speaking to you here, don't make light of it. Value it. Cherish it. Here's the altar call today. If you say, I'm not making light of today. I'm not making light of my marriage. I'm not making light of my kids. I'm not making light of my season. I'm not making light of my challenge. I'm not making light of my hardship. I'm not making light of, if you're serious about God and say, I'm no longer making light of his presence, of his word, of his anointing, then I want you to stand on your feet today and honor the Lord and say, I'm here. Chosen and called. I'm not making light. I'm not making light of it. excuses no more pointing the fingers and the blame 
There's no victims in you. You healed us. You set us free. You called us to your house. I just repent. We just repent for what we've made light of. When you called us to pray and you said, don't do it, and we didn't, we just, we're sorry for the things we've misplaced you and compromised and become careless with. You know why? Because your word says you desire your house to be full and filled, not empty, filled. I just pray that something would happen in the hearts of these people, young and old, and all in between. No more aching, no more hidden things, no more hidden things. We're not turned into a golden calf. No, 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 no. You're the Lord God. It's not the work of our hands. It's not silver and gold. You know what? I'm praying, but I'm also feeling, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to put the Lord on it. I am. I, th- I hope. I think some of you are so concerned with making it through these tough times financially that what if your closeness and nearness to him would be more important than how you're going to make it through these tough times and instead of talking about the famine and the money what about saying take it all like Job I want to be close to your heart be mindful children of God your God is not silver and gold it's not the work of your hands it's the presence of the Lord some trust in chariots some trust in horses but we trust woo woo but we trust and it just may be that the enemy's got your attention so worried about silver and gold my Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken I've never seen it begging of bread come on give God a shout of praise praise the Lord praise the Lord one more thing one more thing There is a mark coming. It's the mark of this world. It's the mark of the beast. It says you won't be able to buy, sell, or trade if we're here or not. I don't know, but I'm ready. If you can't trust God now, it probably will be hard to trust him when you can't take that. If you can't trust him now, it's going to be really hard to trust him when you have no other option. I encourage you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. (laughs) Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he it's coming church it's coming it's literal it's not figurative it's it's real if you're not right with jesus today and he's knocking on your heart i know he is i know he is who's got your attention who's messed up your attitude the twins are back the sons are back don't tell me angel and help me holy spirit abraham the wife of my wife is the voice of the Holy Spirit thank you you're not right with Jesus you're not right with Jesus or you've been making it light you've been taking it lightly I want you to lift your hand and get right with Jesus one two three let me see your hand oh my goodness all over the room just lift them high lift them high lift them high Lift them high, lift them high. It's beautiful. I think our second service is the overflow of first service. So if you want to stay for a second, just hang in here. Just lift it high. Just just keep it up there. Just keep it up there. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for what I made light of. Today, no more carelessness. I'm devoting my life to you. Your word, your presence, what you've given me, your house, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And I say in Jesus' name, be healed. Bodies be healed. Minds be restored. And by the Spirit of God, I say, attention be restored back to the people. Let the attention be restored. Focus and attention be restored in Jesus' name. We have some prayer partners up here if you like prayer. We love you. 
and second service we'll see in the back for meet and greet. Praise, 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 praise the Lord. Also this Wednesday, prayer worship night at seven o'clock. It's one of our favorite times this Wednesday, prayer and worship.